Yep. So today we are going to be looking at uh, chapter six uh, of the book, which is about uh, linear model selection and and regularization. So, like uh, for the running uh, objectives, uh, we are going to select a subset of futures to include in the linear in a linear linear model. Then we are going to also compare and contrast both the forward stepwise, the backward stepwise, the hybrid, and the best subset method for of subsets uh, selection. We are also going to explore how to use shrinkage methods to constrain the flexibility of linear models. Then we are going to compare and contrast the lasso and the rich regression method of shrinkage. Then we look at uh, dimension, uh, reduce how to reduce the dimension of the data for a linear model. Then we are going to compare and contrast the principal component regression and the partial least squares method of dimension reduction, then explain the challenges that occur when fitting a linear model to high dimension data. So like in the context uh, of this chapter, okay? So every model in which we build, every linear model in which we build, there is always this formula where we have response explains by a, a number, a certain number uh, of predictors, then we have the, the data set. So why constraints or remove uh, predictors uh, in a given model? That is what uh, they are trying to talk about there. So why do that? We have to, because we want to improve uh, the prediction accuracy of our model in which we are building. Then we, we need a low bias model by assumptions. Then we put P is equals to what? N, which is, which is a high variance uh, model or meaningless when P is equals to what? N or impossibility when the, the number of predictor ways, which is greater than uh, the sample size. So we can also see how we remove or constrain ir irrelevant variable to simplify uh, the model. So that's, that, is, uh, that is all what we are going to cover in our discussion today. So like uh, the subset selection. So they say, what is it? They say it's a group of method that directly reduce the number of predictors by removing the ones that doesn't improve this error. So, so we are we have set certain number of predictors. So we need to eliminate those um, predictors that doesn't improve the performance of our model. So, like the best subset uh, selection. So they said is the most straightforward approach. Okay. So to perform the best subset selection. They say we fit a separate least square regression for each possible combination of the P predictors. So we are fitting different model uh, for all the P predictors. That is, we fit all P models selection that contain exactly one predictor, which is the first. Then we have P of two, which is P into P minus one over two models that contain exactly two predictors. So we follow. Uh, in this order to fit for other predictors in which we have uh, in the model. But what, has, what is the algorithm? The algorithm behind uh, this model is that we start with the null model. That is the intercept only model, model that has only intercept, which is our M, which is our M0. Then we keep on adding predictors into the model one after the other. So we have, we have the first predictor, we have the second predictor, we have the third predictor, until we get to the P predictor. So we fit all P to K model containing the K predictors. Then let M to K denote the best of this P to K model. We have best is defined as having what? The best model is the model that has the lowest residual sum of square the low, and also the lowest uh, deviance. So we can say that is the best model. So we choose the best model among MO to what MP where best is defined as having the lowest, the lowest uh, CP, BIC, which is the Bayesian information criterion, archaic information criterion, and also the cross validated mean square error or alternative highest adjusted R square, which is uh, what we have for, for the best model. So, but the best subset selection, if the pros, the good side of this is that we help us to what, select the best subset in, in our model. We are going to select the best subset. Why the downside of this approach is that 
overfitting due to last set uh, space, so which is one problem in which they discuss in the book. And also another one is about computationally expensive, intractable for large P, that is when the number of predictors uh, is large, becomes, uh, it takes a longer time for us to fit uh, all, all the models. So I think uh, uh, that is that for best uh, subsect selection. I don't know if there are any questions or any comments before we proceed. Like you are muted, are you? Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. So the, uh, this other part is about uh, the other alternative uh, to the best subset selection. They talk about uh, this stepwise subset. Uh, they talk about this uh, stepwise subset selection, where we'll be looking at the the forward subset selection in this approach. So the forward subset selection. It starts with a null model, that is a M0, which is a model with no predictors, only the intercept model. So that is where we start. Then we keep on adding predictors into the model. We add, we keep on adding predictors into the model. So with the goal of selecting the model that that what in, increases uh, the, the R square. So we need to look at select the predictor that raises the R square the most and add it to model MK minus one to create the model MK. So we select the model among MO to what MK, which is the model. So we know that model MO is the what null model, which is no predictors. It only have an inter intercept. So we keep on adding predictors into the model one after the other with the main aim of selecting the model that in improves the R square, uh, the R square. Ah, so we minimize validation error. So when we have P is equals to 20, best subset selection requires fitting more than about one point, more than one million model is gonna be fit when we are using the best uh, subset selection. But when we are using the forward stepwise subset selection, so we are only fitting 211 models. So we can see that the, subs, uh, the subset selection is computational intensive because we are fitting a lot of model. But when we are using the forward stepwise selection, we fit in a model with no predictors, then we keep on adding predictors one after the other with the main aim of, uh, of selecting those predictors that uh, improve the R square of the model. So uh, that is what I got from this uh, chapter, which is about forward uh, stepwise. Okay, so the next, this, of the, this is what the opposite of the forward stepwise is the backward stepwise uh, subset selection. This is the opposite of the forward. So the backward stepwise selection provide an efficient alternative to the best subset selection, okay? It begins with the full least square model containing all the P predictors. So we fit a model containing all the predictors and then Iteratively, we are going to what, remove the least useful predictor one at a time. We keep on knocking those least useful predictors one after the other. We knock them off this model until we arrive at the model that give us uh, the best estimate. So we make sure that number of sample is greater than uh, the number of uh, predictors, okay? So we let MP denote the full model with all P predictors. So for K, it's gonna be, K is equals to P, and we have P minus one. Then we consider all K model that results in dropping a single predictor from MK thus containing K minus one uh, predictors. Then we have to choose the best among these K models and pristine it as what? MK minus one. So we select the model among MO to what MK that minimizes uh, the validation error or some estimates of it. So we can see that this is just the opposite of what uh, we have. I'm, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll call you back. I'll call you back. I'm in a meeting. 
So now we have hybrid searches. Okay, so hybrid searches, what does hybrid searches do? Hybrid searches combine the forward subset selection and the backward uh, subset selection. It combines this approach together. So the variable added sequentially, but after adding also, this I'm coming, this I'm coming, let Okay, sorry for that. So we say the variable added sequentially, but after adding also any, also may remove any variable that no longer provide an improvement in fit. So any variable that do not improve the fit of the model. So we are going to remove it using this hybrid search. So this hybrid search is like combination of a uh, different approach uh, of fitting the model, but we'll see more of this when we get into the labs. So now choosing the best model. So how do we choose uh, the best model among the, the subsets, the forward and also the backward? So you have to punish models for having too many predictors. So that is one key point uh, future in which we got. We need to punish a model for having too many predictors. So whatever the method, the residual sum of square decreases, the R square increases as we go from MK model to MK minus one does. MP always wins that contest. So going with MP doesn't provide either of the benefits, model interpretability and variance reduction. We will need to estimate test error in every uh, in our model. So we have the CP uh, adjustment method. So we have CP given by, by this equation where we have one all over the sample size multiplied by residual sum of square plus 2k epsilon square, which is the estimate of the error of the variance of the error associated with the, each of the response uh, measurement, typically estimated using MP. So we have AIC, which is the archaic information uh, criterion, which is given uh, by uh, by this equation, we also have the Bayesian information criteria, which we can estimate using this. Then we have the adjusted R square, which is one minus residual sum of square all over total sum of square times N minus one, which is a sample size minus one all over N minus K minus one. Okay, so these are all, these are very, very important uh, metrics in which we can use in reaching making decisions when, so when we working with uh, the our linear model so so adjustment avoid adjustment methods so we use this can be hard to come by which is the estimate of the variance of the error it can be very difficult uh, to come by that is once uh, thing they said in the book chapter so adjustment method make assumption about true model example gaussian error so cross we have to use uh, cross uh, uh, validation approach. So shrinkage methods is another is another techniques in which uh, they talk about in the book. So like a brief uh, overview of this is that is they said shrinkage is a method that is used to fit a model containing all p predictors using a technique that constrains or regularizes regular, regularizes uh, the coefficient estimates. They say shrinkage reduces variance and can perform variable uh, selection. So substantial reduction in variance for a slight increase in bias. So we achieve this uh, deciteria by penalizing parameters. We, we can also produce models between the null model and the ordinary least square uh, estimates. So the OLS reviewed, which is the ordinary least square, Okay, we have beta, which is uh, given uh, by this equation. So we can also have beta for the OLS, which is given by this, which is a uh, residual uh, sum of square. Okay, so for the rich uh, regression, rich uh, regression is very similar to least square, except that uh, the coefficient are estimated by 
minimizing a slightly different uh, different quantity. So rich regression, we still we are still making use of the same idea we got from the OLS, which is we got this. So we have admin, which is RSS, but we are only introducing this new term uh, to the rich, which is called the lambda. And the lambda is a tuning parameter for shrinkage uh, penalty. We just introduced lambda. And so this, so there is one model parameter, which is lambda doesn't shrink, which is uh, that parameter is beta zero. So this one, uh, once we fit it in the model, uh, it does not uh, shrink. So they also gave the rich regression uh, visually uh, using this, okay? Where we have the squared bias, which is, uh, which is the block, which is this block line. Okay, we have the variance, which is given by the green line in this uh, graph. We also have the test mean squared error, which is uh, the purple line. Then we also have the, uh, we also have the horizontal dash line, which indicate the possible, the minimum possible mean square error, which is uh, the line we are seeing here. Then the purple crosses and get a rich regression model which, for which the mean square error is the smallest, which is this. Because in our own case, working with model, we want to select the model that give us the, the, the lowest mean square error, which, so the, uh, they say that uh, uh, when processing this, so we should know that beta j RN scale variance. So uh, they gave us uh, this equation where we have x i j all over the square root of one all over the sample size uh, summation of n by i. We have uh, this, okay? So then they say it is best to apply uh, rich regression after standardizing the predictor using the formula above. So, so rich regression is best applied when all this is uh, standardized. So I'll just pause there. I don't know uh, if there are comments uh, or co contribution before we move to the lasso regression. Any comments or any question? I'm not sure if you're going to get to it in the notes, but bridge the shrinkage, it never shrinks all the way down to zero, right? Yes, yes, yes. No, this rich is just help to shrink this them down, but not all the way around. Uh, let's see, I think they stated that in one of the sections. I think I highlighted that. Which, which. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Okay, they say how with our lambda also may approach infinity. Uh, and once lambda approach infinity, the impact of the shrinking penalty grows and the rich regression coefficient estimate will also approach zero. So it's, the value approaches zero. Okay, so the lasso regression, I think they gave us uh, also a similar equation. So we still have some of the terms in which we have in the reach for the lasso. So, but for the rich ones, we are fitting the model. So, we, you know, we are trying to shrink it way down closer as the value approaches uh, zero, okay? But one problem, one drawback of this is always in the rich, it always include all the predictors in the model. But lasso, so the more improvement of that version, I think is the lasso regression because the lasso regression will knock off those, it will, it will drop some, of the, those are uh, predictors in the model. So, but it shrinks some coefficient towards zero create, to create a sparse uh, model. So we can see the lasso uh, model uh, is being presented uh, uh, visually here, where we have income, we have limits, we have rating, and also we have uh, students, okay? And this is based on the, on the credit uh, uh, data sets. 
So here we are looking at left, which is a plot of the square bias, which is black, which is a square variance, which is given in green, and the test mean square error, which is given in purple. Uh, for the lasso on a simulated data set, right? Is a comparison of square bias variance and the test mean square error between lasso, which is the solid line. Uh, we have reach, which is the dotted line. Both are plotted against their R square on the training data as a common form of indexing crosses of both. So we can see here, we can see the model with this lowest uh, main square error. We can see that, that is where we, uh, they highlighted it uh, with the, uh, with the cross. So they said, how does lasso eliminate uh, predictors? Because rich doesn't eliminate predictor, he still retain all the predictors. So how does lasso eliminate uh, predictors? It can be shown that this shrinkage method are equivalent to the OLS, which is the ordinary least square with a constant that depends on the type of shrinkage for two parameters. So here we have, beta one plus beta two less than or equals to S for lasso regression. We also have beta one square plus beta two square less than or equals to S for reach. So the value of S, okay, depends on lambda. Larger S corresponding to smaller uh, lambda. So we can see this uh, graphically, okay, where the contours of the error and constant function for the lasso, which is the left, and also the ridge, which is the right. The solid blue area are the constant region. So these are the constant regions, okay, while the red ellipse are the contours for, of the residual uh, sum of square. The lasso constraints has corners at each of the axes, and so the ellipse will often intersect the constraint region at an axis. Okay, so like for the Bayesian interpretation, so the Bayesian interpretation, we have this x is equals to x1 to what xp, then we have beta, which is equals to this. So the probability of this, okay, is given by this equation. So often the prior, the prior takes the form of this, which is p into beta, is equals uh, to this. So, but the Gaussian prior for each beta correspond to the rich uh, regression. Double exponential prior for each beta corresponds uh, to lasso. So they say the rich regression is the, po is the posterior mode for beta under a Gaussian prior right, which is uh, right, the lasso posterior mode for beta under the double exponential uh, prior. So uh, uh, this is just uh, a brief about uh, the variation uh, way of interpreting this. Uh, I, I will pause there to see if I have a question or comment. Okay, thank you. So like uh, the next is about uh, dimension reduction. So which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, unsupervised, uh, we have uh, to transform predictors before we use using them in the model. So we have Z1, we have Z2 to ZM, which represents M less than P linear combination of original P predictors. So we have uh, this equation and this symbol which stands, I think it stands for the loadings uh, for the principal component. So we have Linear regression using a transform predictors can often outperform linear regression using uh, original predictors because when we transform the, the predictors, we, are, we know that all the predictors, they are going to be, they will not fall on the same scale rather than we using the original data that way because some of those, that some of those predictors, they can be of a different scale. So once we transform those predictors, we ensure that they are all of the, uh, the same scale. So the math behind this, I think we have ZM, which is summation of this, okay? I think this is gonna give us the value 
for the loadings, which we are going to need in our principal components. So they say that um, this is given by, by this equation. So they say the dimension reduction constraints beta j. So we can increase bias, but significantly reduce uh, variance when m is less than p predictors. So we have, we also have principal components uh, regression. So PCA chooses the loading to capture as much variance as, as possible. We need to capture as much variance as possible. We'll be discussed, they said that we'll discuss this further when we are looking at uh, chapter 12 of the book. So the first principal component, which is PC1, is the direction of the data that, that along which the observation varied the most because the first PCA is going to have the higher, explain the highest variability in which we have in the data set, followed by the second principal component follow in that and others with subsequent PC followed uh, that order. So the highest variability we have in the data is gonna be captured by the first principal component. So we said the second principal component orthogonal to the first capture the next most uh, variation in which we have in the data. So we create new predictors that are more independent and potentially fairer, which improve test mean square error. But note that the, this does not help improve interpretability. All P predictors are still involved in our model. So we have this example that was created uh, using the where we plotted the advertising spending in Y, and we also have population in the X. So we can see that the first principal component was able to capture which is this green line, was able to capture the highest, the most variability in which we have in this data set, followed by, followed by the second PC, which is the blue line, okay? Which capture the second most highest uh, variation which uh, we have in the data. So we can also see the principal component regression approach where we have, still have the advertising spending, we still have the population, here we have the first principal component, which is going to explain most majority of the variation in which we have in the data. So we all followed, and this was closely followed uh, by the second PC. And this was given by this equation, where 0 0.839 is going to be the PC loadings, which is the loading multiplied by the population minus the population mean plus the another. This, this is the second loading multiplied by advertising spending minus the mean for the advertising spending. So we just need to plug this in to this equation to give us the value of our C, C1. So we also have principal component uh, regression, which is given uh, shown visually where we have principal component regression here. We have the square bias, we have the test mean square error, we also have the variance. This is for the rich regression and also uh, the lasso regression uh, combined using this, uh, the shrinkage factor. Okay, here we are using the number of components here uh, which, which we have in the model. So we said uh, uh, figure 6.9, which is this figure, it helps us to mitigate overfitting by re reducing the number of variable because principal components it's got to split everything into different uh, dimension in which we have in the data. So we also assume that the, the direction in which X shows the most variation are the direction associated uh, with variation in Y. So when, when assumption is true, principal component regression can do very well. It can perform very well once our assumption for that is very is true. But we should also, they also say we should note that PCR is in future selection since PC depends on all P, so most like rich than lasso. So the best standardized variable before the best is for us to standardize our variable before before we do the principal uh, components uh, before we do the principal component regression. So here they gave us an example in the figure below. 
They use principal component regression fits on simulated data as shown. Both we are generated using n is equals to what 50. So we have 50. The sample size is just 50. Observation we have 45 number of predictors. First data set response uses all predictors, while in the second it uses only two uh, predictors. The PCR improved over O ordinary least square, at least in the first case. In the second case, the improvement is modest, perhaps because the assumption that the direction of mass, maximum variation in predictor doesn't correlate well with variation in the response as assumed by the principal component uh, regression. So here we have the number of components. So you, here we can see we have squared bias, which is given by this black line. So we have test mean square error, which is this. Okay, we also have the variance. Okay, so we also have uh, the dotted line, which is where we have the best uh, mean square error. So here yeah, we said that when variation in X isn't strongly correlated with variation in Y, PCR isn't as effective. So we cannot use the principal component uh, regression. It's not going to be what effective when the variation in X is not strongly correlated uh, with the variation in Y. So they say uh, the PCR approach is not going to be effective uh, in that case. So here yeah, they were talking about uh, partial least squares where we have partial least squares is like PCA, but supervised use of Y to choose. In this figure, pop population is more related to Y than advertising uh, space spending. So in practice, partial least square often isn't better than rich or uh, principal components are regression. So supervision can reduce bias versus but can also increase uh, the variance. So we have, here we have the advertising spending in the Y, and also we have uh, the population. We can see uh, the, the, okay, so uh, this part here, they were talking about uh, considerations when we are working with high dimension data. So high dimension data simply refers to those data in which we have uh, the, we have more number of predictors. Okay, which is uh, probably what we uh, encounter today in, uh, in, in, in research because we need to collect uh, more data to address uh, the type of problem which we are trying to solve. So here we have, data sets. So here we can see we just have two data points in this case, but here we can see we have uh, more data points, but we can, from visually, from me seeing this, I can see that uh, the, this is not, uh, the linear model is not doing a, a good uh, job. Yeah, I can see that it's not doing a good job because we can see the points, uh, majority of the points, they are widely dispersed. So data set containing more futures than observation, okay? And are often referred to as high dimensional data. That is what we call high dimensional data. They has more predictors, okay, than the sample. So modern data can have push number of predictors, which is 500,000 SNPs, SNP word every entered in a, entered in a search, which is SNPs simple stand for the single, nucleotide uh, polymorphism. So where n is less, less than the predictor, linear regression memorizes the training data but can stock on the test uh, data. Okay, so here we have, we have number of variables, okay, which is like number of predictors in which we have here, we have from zero to around 20. We have, these are the number of predictor. We have R square, okay for goodness of fit of that model, we have also have training mean square error and also uh, the test mean square error. So here they, they were talking about lasso versus dimensionality. They were trying to see how they compare uh, lasso versus the so dimensionality reduction, which is the principal component analysis. They say reducing 
flexibility, all, all the stuff in this chapter can help. So, but it is important to choose good tuning parameter for whatever method uh, we choose, want to use. So futures that aren't associated uh, with Y increases test error cause of dimensionality. Fits to noise in training, noise in the test, test is different. So where, when P is greater than N, so when the number of predictors is greater than the samples, so never use mean square error. But when P values, when P values R square ETC as evidence of goodness of fit because they are likely to be widely different from test values. So here we have a model where we have 20 predictors. We have a model where we have 50 predictors. We also have a model where we have 2,000 2000 predictors. So here we can see the degree of freedom, degree of freedom, degree of freedom. So here we can see uh, with that we have, there is some kind of variability uh, going on here, but for here, we can see that uh, there is no much uh, difference where we have larger uh, number of predictors. So like for, uh, for the exercise seven, so we, uh, they take a model given by, by this equation. So here, E1 uh, from a normal random distribution where we have a sample size zero, and this uh, stands for, I think, the variance of the error. The likelihood is simply a product of normal distribution with mean, which is given by this, and standard deviation uh, given by uh, this equation. Okay, so I think uh, the rest, uh, the rest is just uh, about uh, the uh, going through uh, the equation. Okay, so I don't know if we can go through the short exercise in the lab. I think we still have time. I think there is some short exercise where they were trying to explain. Okay, so I think, uh, so they were trying to look at, we can uh, go through the subset selection method. So best subset selection, how we can implement that in practice. So they were using the ISL2, so where we can get this data set, the ETAS data set. Okay, they check for the number of missing data. So then, then they, they are using this package to, uh, to get this function, reg subset, which we are going to use for the best subset selection. So we have the salary, which is what we are trying to predict, explained by every other predictors. And this is the data. So when we look at the summary of reg fits, so we can see the summary uh, gave us this. So what is going to show us is that those model, okay, that are going to make a, do a perform a good job. You can see them, they are going to be star. So those models in which we have the highest star. So from this first one, we can see that the heat, okay? We can see the heat and CRBI. So they can do a better job. We can see that they did a better job in this uh, using uh, the best uh, subset uh, selection. So we can also, we can also fit this same model, Rex uh, subsets. So this is the model. So we look at the summary of the model. So, but when we look at the names of the model, we can see that we have R square. We can also have residual sum of square. We can also we, oh, we can also pull out adjusted R square. Uh, the uh, Wallman CP, uh, BIC, Outmart, and uh, Okay, so we can also look at reg summary. We can look at the R square value. We can see that the R square value it was moving from 0 0.321 to what 0 0.546. Okay, this is this is when we have the maximum number of uh, predictors when we have 19 predictors. So by default, I think by default, uh, we always have eight number of predictors in this 
function will return eight predictors by default. So, but if you want to pull in uh, all the predictor, we can just specify this function that NV max is equals to 19 so that we can get the maximum number of 19, maximum number of predictor as 19. So, but we can also visualize this, which is going to give us the plot just as we have already seen in the book. It's just going to display uh, the plot for us. But I think we'll explore this more when we are going through the labs uh, next week. So this is also going to be adjusted R square, R square, CP, and also uh, BLC. So this approach, we can also use this approach to fit the forward and also the backward stepwise selection. So how do we do that? We just need to say reg subset. We specify the response explained by every other predictors. Then we say data is eaters. Then we specify that we want 19. The number of predictors that we want to return is 19. Then here we just have to add the method. We say forward. So when we say method is forward, it's going to fill a null model, which is an intercept model with zero predictors. Then it's going to start adding those predictors one after the other. So we can also do the same thing here by looking at the summary. Then we can also do the same thing here by specifying method is equals to what backwards. So here, you know, it's going to fix all, add all the predictors and it starts eliminating them one after the other. I did not know about this function. There is another way I used to do once I want to use, uh, once I want to fix this, there's another approach I used to use, but when I went through the chapter, uh, that is when I uh, discovered that I, I, I can also do this uh, using this approach. So this is just pulling out uh, the coefficients for, for all for the model in which we are fit. So this uh, is about choosing among uh, the model, which one we are going to choose. So uh, the there is also a function in which we can use uh, to choose among the model, which one is doing uh, a good job. So I think uh, I will. I think I will stop there. I don't know if there are any question. We meet again next week. If there are no question, I think we'll meet again next week uh, for the labs. I just have one comment on uh, the model selection methods. So I guess okay. uh, the chapter's approach is to look at um, the accuracy of the model. Uh, let's say if there are two or three variables that are found to be significant, uh, I don't think they are considered in the model because everything is based on which one produces the best uh, test accuracy. Can you come again? I guess significance is ignored. The significance of the individual variables in the model. That yes, is yes, yes. For the best yes. model. Yes, yes, yes. That one is not considered. Yeah. But I yeah, think thank you for, for looking at uh, models where uh, the behavior of one variable, how it affects the other, uh, the response variable could be important. We yes. want to understand what is the relationship between them. In that case, I think model selection methods should also consider the significance of the variables. Yep, thank you very much for that. Thank you, I really appreciate. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... I've read a lot of Max Kuhn's comments on that, and it seems like in the applied machine learning world, inference and prediction are, are two sides of the same coin. And the key value of, of some coefficients is not considered relevant if it doesn't actually increase the test accuracy. Hmm. Like the the, the the coefficient used for inference is is, uh, is based on the training data, right? Yeah. So yes. so if you're trying to understand some process, I guess the, the other perspective there, which is, I guess, is contrary, is if the model doesn't make good predictions on data that it hasn't seen before, are those coefficients even relevant? Yeah. 
even if the p-value is 0 0.0001. Yeah. But in practice, I think test accuracy is really important, even while we want to look at the relationship and the type yeah. of relationship. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you all for joining today. I really appreciate, I think, the session we, it was, I love at the flow and also the interactive session. I really appreciate all comments and inputs. So I think I will we'll meet again uh, next week where I'll go through uh, the labs. Thank you. I'll see you all next week. All right, bye. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.